You're listening to Track Talk with the Racing Boys, brought to you by McCarthy Chevrolet in Olathe, or visit them online at McCarthy Chevy. Money just dropped for whatever. Welcome back. You're listening to the Racing Boys. I'm Kirk Elliott in Kansas City. Scott Trailer up in South Dakota is heading out to the northwest. We have Monty Dutton here just a second ago. We'll try to reconnect with him here in just a minute. But, uh, Scott, big race tonight. Always big when they go to Daytona. Yep, it's going to be a big week. Hey, Kirk, uh, before we get into talking a little bit NASCAR, I've got to remind people to, uh, about McCarthy Chevrolet. Um, they were... They are now uh, the number number four in the country when it comes to certified used cars. Last month, Money is there, that, drop. that is the entire country. We'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, man, they've got great deals on cars right now. Rates starting as l- little as one point nine percent interest on used cars right now. Monty, how you doing? I'm just fine. How you getting along? Oh well, it's been one of those nights and one of those early mornings, but we're going to survive, I think, on our end. I'm having to be on the phone. I appreciate you calling in. Um, talked to you a little bit yesterday. You're down at Daytona qualifying. Um, my guy that I picked yesterday on between the lines, and I don't think it's a stretch of a pick. Obviously, Matt Kenson, who uh, won the Daytona 500 and finished third at uh, Talladega after leading all those laps, gets on the pole. How about that? Well, I think there's two things. First of all, uh, Kansas does not often qualify well. That's and when true. he does qualify well, he's almost always a big factor in the race. I should hasten to add that it is a little bit different with plate races where I don't think the starting position, there's so much shuffling during the course of the day that I don't think that the, that the starting position makes as much difference. But it certainly shows that he has a quality car. And I think another thing down here is that there's – it happens, I don't know, fairly often, certainly more than plate tracks and other places, but there's sort of a rash of uh, technical issues. You know, Tony Stewart uh, originally, the clock, he'll have to start in the back because he had a air hose supposedly come loose during his run, and uh, Austin Dillon uh, was disallowed in the Nationwide Series because of a similar thing, although they say that the circumstances are different. But they always stretch the rules because uh, every little... Every little chunk of horsepower helps when you're at a plate race. Hey, Monty, while we're talking about Matt Kenseth, and I know it's been a week now since he made the announcement that he's going to be leaving Roush, a lot of people wonder what the real reason is. Was it, was there some kind of animosity towards the contract that Carl got and the way they went about it? Is it just Matt wanting to move on? Is it better opportunity for him on the other side? What's your feel on that situation? Well, I think that uh, I think it's sort of maybe a similar, similar. I don't think that it's there's a lot of discord there. I think that uh, I think maybe when you hear Jack Rouse say that he takes the blame because he should have personally dealt with it and he didn't and he didn't know anything about it until well, he didn't know that Matt was going elsewhere until other people came and told him. Mm-hmm. I think that maybe there might have been some mild feeling in Matt's mind of sort of neglect, like the biggest thing in the world happened. But, you know, the Edwards thing was a huge uh, issue you talked about every day and all kind of behind-the-scenes stuff. And this one was quieter. Now, I don't know whether this one was quieter because Matt Kinsley is quieter, <laughs> and that's his way, or whether uh, he felt like they didn't work that hard to keep him. I don't know. Now, are, are you genuinely surprised where uh, Jack Roush, because when I watched that interview with him, I, I I believed him that he wasn't involved in the contract negotiations up to the last minute. He felt like uh, he didn't realize it was getting away from him. Do you think that that might be part of the problem, is that Jack Roush wasn't more hands-on with him during those negotiations, and that might have bothered Matt? You know, he's he is kind of his elite driver right now, winning the championship in two Daytona 500s. I can't speak for either party, but I can I, I can go based on what on what Jack says. Uh I think maybe, I mean, I, I just, I, as I said, sometimes I hate to get inside the brains of other people. Right. But, so, and then I think there's also things where, in this situation, what what is comparatively a minor issue, because it is a minor issue and people talk about it, it becomes a major issue. So that, uh, probably from Kenza's point of view, he just shopped himself and looked out in the best offer out there. He decided that he was going to make a decision that he was. Uh, I think it is 
pertinent to note that, I mean, uh, I, I think that rather than the Edwards thing a year ago, I think this might be more similar to when Mark Martin left Rouse. Mm -hmm. In that I think, now I do believe in this instance that at that time, the Mark Martin of that period was a very different person than the Mark Martin of the day. He'd gotten kind of burned out and really wanted to, uh, wanted to retire. Mm -hmm. Except that because of the fact that the sponsorship was tied to him, he agreed to drive another year, and he agreed to drive another year. And I think in Mark's mind, he pretty much said, well, that's all I owe Jack Rouse, you know. And then Mark ran, started running, sort of reinvigorated himself and started realizing how much he loved it. And I think Mark changed a lot, and I think the Mark of Mark Martin of today is a much more fun-loving guy who's more interested at this time in his career to going out there and having a great time, not, not being weighed down by all, all the obligations. And one and question so, I've got to ask you for our afternoon host, uh, Kevin Keesman on Between the Lines. He had, we had this discussion with him yesterday. I kind of want to get your take on it. He says, why is NASCAR the way it is when it comes to guys that are going to be free agents? Shouldn't they wait till the end of the season like in all other sports? Should there be tampering laws? or uh, what? Why couldn't NASCAR do that? For I'm, And, again, I'm asking this question for Kevin. Well, first of all, there isn't any such – all NASCAR drivers are free agents. They're only bound by their contract. They don't have a draft. They don't have. They, they don't have any kind of salary cap. They don't have any kind of union. Uh, it, it's completely free market. I think that the answer to why don't don't you do it at the end of the season is because the off season is so tiny that you that before the end of this season you're preparing for next season. And just the way that it shakes down, uh, I, I don't think that waiting to sign with the team at the end of the season, it sometimes happens. But I don't think that's the preferred way to do it just because of all that goes into preparing for a new driver with a new team next year. And my question, Monty, was how do you enforce it? I mean, as you pointed out, these guys are not members of a union. Now, yeah, you can have litigation, but how, how, do you, how would you enforce something like that like you can in other sports where there are unions? Well, there's not any standard rules. Every contract is different. People who always call in on radio shows, they they ask questions and they ask from the mindset of another sport. Because the truth is, uh, I really think in NASCAR that the way they do it, the secret of the way they do it is counterproductive. Because what happens is, is that nobody ever releases the terms of a contract. So all you ever get is what people tell you in confidence. And people tend to exaggerate that. It's just like the old Statler Brothers song, about how to be a country star, to say you're making more than you are. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you ask, well, how many years is this? Well, it's month a year. Well, how many years is that? Well, we're not really saying. Well, how much did you make it? I wouldn't tell you that. That's a private matter. Yeah, and, and, and so it, 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 is this really bad for the next guy over the other team? And he says, well, what I hear, he's got making $15 million plus blah, 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 blah. And pretty soon, because there's no one to dispute that, that becomes the common, that becomes the party line. Yeah, and, and money. Yeah, go ahead. Is this really bad for the sport, though? I mean, you know, it, that, that opinion, was a whole discussion. I'm a writer. Yeah. In, in my opinion, it is, but I'm a sports writer. Of course, I'd like to see more openness. But, I mean, I think that, that having the situation the way it is is counterproductive in the long run. It's better for the sport to be open. I know, I, I mean, I can look up any time I want to who, what, what the salary is of every baseball player. It's all conjecture. I mean, right. the fact is, is it, it's all conjecture. You know, what happens is we'll say, uh, as I said, you go with the out next team, and pretty soon it becomes a common view that this guy's making this much. Then three years later, he goes out and he says, I don't know what's wrong with you people. I wasn't ever making that much. Mm -hmm. well, why do you put these things? Well, we couldn't get it from you. You know, so it, it, to me it becomes, you know, kind of a never-ending uh, uh, process, and I just think it would be better if they did it. I think it would be better. I think the fans want to know. I think the writers want to know. And, uh, I, and you know, Everything in the sport is so secretive. A lot of that has to do with the inherent commercialism and the fact that the first priority is to make sure that whatever the sponsors want is what they get. Yeah. What, uh, what's the feel down there with the national media that follows NASCAR all the time about Bruton Smith's comments about having uh, TV cautions? And, and I saw the response by Brian France, but w what are most people saying about that? To me, it's surprising that the, that the opinion is as much decided. The most adamantly against him is Carl Edwards, and I agree with him. And I mean, there's actually there's so many things that to me are sort of hilarious. One of the things that, that Brian Francis' annual address yesterday, is he said 
in, in, in sort of oblique reference to that. He said, I don't know what we'll do, but one thing that we're not going to do is, is the gin it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, the room almost started laughing. What is the thing that you must identify with Brian Friends? Gimmicks. I mean, at the time it was done, the chase was a gimmick. Wave rounds are a gimmick. You know, I mean, double file restarts aren't a gimmick. That was just a thing whose idea of time had come. But, um, you know, it's kind of like uh, 10 years ago, if you'd said, well, hey, let's make it like a basketball game and have a halftime. You know, right. we could have a yellow, a mandatory yellow, and the band could play. <laughs> yeah, you know, the wild card. Different. I mean, you look the at the, the wild cards getting into the, the final two spots. That's a gimmick. Things have changed so much that what would have been the most ridiculous thing in the world 10 years ago now sounds, well, hey, maybe we ought to try that. You know, next thing you know, I mean, you know, we're morphing. Who knows what's going to happen next? We might be having, uh, well, you know, we might he- have a heat races and a D main and a, and a 50 lap, uh, uh, feature at the end, <laughs> at, at the way it's going. And I mean, I'm not against that on a short track, and maybe that would, but I mean, uh, I, I, I fled over the side. I don't like, I mean, I think it's okay to shorten some races. I think from 500 to 400 is probably good. But I think one of the things that sets Cup apart from nationwide is the fact that it requires endurance. And there's a lot of drivers who are highly successful at the lower level who that, that extra length just gives them one more chance to mess up during the day, mm-hmm. during the race. And I think that separates the men from the boys in some ways. So I don't like to see that, but I've been, you know, you can't, you can make a living betting against me. Yeah. Bruton was right on cue, though. I mean, it was Kentucky weekend. He, he's good at grandstanding and getting some attention out there. And sometimes when people think that, that race, some people thought was a little boring. This is a, uh, a way to kind of camouflage that and kind of get people's attention in another area sometimes. Well, I think that the general reaction of the drivers to this notion is m- sort of mildly negative. Edwards was the most adamant, and I think Edwards was very honest, and I admire what he had to say. Uh, but there are a lot of people who said, there are some people who say, well, I think a mandatory schedule caution would be better than a, a suspicious one, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, and uh, so it wasn't all together. It, it was actually fairly balanced, but I think basically most drivers didn't like the idea, but they mm, wouldn't, uh, they're not going to jump up. They're not going to quit the sport forever if they do it. <laughs> Monty, I want to talk about Brad Keselowski. He's uh, he's a star now. There's nobody won more races so far this year than Brad Keselowski, and last week was very interesting indeed. After he got in a practice incident with Juan Montoya, they had to go to a backup car. I think it was a short track car. They they got it all ready to go for him. Couldn't even get the steering wheel right right at the start of the race, and he goes on and wins last Saturday night down at Kentucky. How good is Brad Keselowski? Well, he's very good, and he's and and, and I think that. Uh, the biggest thing I think about him is that he's got it all. Because I said before he had his breakthrough, if this was at the beginning of the 2011 season, I was basically thinking, man, what a rival you got going between Edwards and Keselowski. And this was great. The only thing that lacks is Keselowski becoming a factor at the cup level. Well, he became that last year. And I have never seen any driver so well prepared for stardom. He had to get that. He had to prove it on the racetrack. But Brad Keselowski is a guy who has got this sport figured out. He knows how to deal with the media. He knows how to, he's thoughtful. He, he's a, a, a good copy. Uh, I also think that one of the best things that Keselowski did was that right, you know, you have a lot of guys who come in the cup and they're real mild mannered and they want to get along with all the top drivers. And, uh, I think if you do that too much, all you show the top drivers is that they can push you around. And I think Keselowski, from the minute he arrived, basically said, look, I'm here now, and I'm not taking anything from anybody. Mm-hmm. I don't think Keselowski, I think Keselowski is an aggressive driver, but I don't think he's a dirty driver, but I think he doesn't back off from anybody. And I think that, too, is the stuff of Scott. Isn't that how he was raised? I mean, Bob Keselowski was his dad. I think he understood that at a young age. This is the way you got to be if you want to be successful in this sport, don't you think? Yes, and I also think that's the secret to, to Brad. I think coming up from a racing family, he knows the business inside out. But he's also somebody who's put a lot of time into thinking and planning for what would be the best way. I think Brad Keselowski is a guy who dreamed about being a star and thought a lot about what it would be like and got his head straight about what he wanted to do in a way that I've never seen anyone else. 
that was, I mean, every driver I've ever known reaches this point where they say, hey, look, all I didn't want to do is drive race cars. I didn't sign up for all this media and all these commercials and talking to all these groups. I think Brad knew and recognized that you had to have the full package to make it in sport. He's capitalizing because of the fact that he's so well prepared. Monty, before we let you go, I got to ask you, um, what what's going on with Dodge? Are they going to be in the sport next year? I mean, they've already showed their new car for 2013, but they don't have a team. We hear Michael Andretti. It could be. Um, it, who's some of the other people that really are in the best position? Is Richard Petty Motorsports the team that Dodge is going to go to? What do you feel is going to happen? I may be wrong, but I think that the Richard Petty Motorsports thing is largely a rumor that spreads because it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think Richard, I think RPM is in really good shape with the alignment they have right now with Ford. And I think they're taking a tremendous uh, chance because they aren't prepared to have the type, uh, have the type of impact, in, uh, you know, like engine production, things like that that it entails. Now, I think that Dodge obviously... Uh, the Michael Andretti thing, there may be a little something to it, but I question a whole lot whether whether it'll work very well. I really think there's a good possibility, as long as this keeps going, and as long as Dodge doesn't make any pronouncements, and as long as people tweet Ralph Gila from Dodge and on Twitter, they ask, like, are you willing to make a commitment to the, that you'll be in the sport at all? And he says, no, we're not ready to make that commitment yet. And because of their relationship with the new owners of the company, it's Fiat, isn't it? That, yes. That, uh, we, all, we keep hearing that, that Fiat just doesn't get it about NASCAR and that they're active in all kinds of other things. So I think there's a battle within that company between people who want to stay in NASCAR and who don't. And the longer this clock ticks, to me, the longer the, the, the more the likelihood that Dodge won't be in the sport next year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's, a, that, you know, you say, well, maybe they'll uh, go back to their historic identification. Okay. You say, well, maybe they'll bring in Michael Andretti or maybe they'll, They'll latch on to some teams. You know, how about the Furniture Road team that's struggling this year, Reagan Smith? But what about Robbie Gordon? You know, he's the guy that has a huge complex. Go ahead. What about Robbie Gordon? He would. He's a guy with a huge complex. He, he said on Wind Tunnel as much as that he, he's got the fab shop and everything to do it. Is, is that just too high a risk, do you think, for Dodge to do, go to a single-car team like Robbie Gordon? Look at Robbie Gordon's history in NASCAR. Don't you think that's a risk? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Robbie Gordon is a really talented guy, but he's one of the great examples of a guy that you're going to look when it's all over and you say, man, the talent that guy had, if he could have just, you know, used it. On his I mean, I think, Rob, I think Robbie Gordon is one of those guys who'd rather be right than be president. You know? He's the guy who, when they said you couldn't, uh, you couldn't shift, they didn't want you to shift gears at Pocono, which they're doing again now, he decided, well, I don't care what they do, I'm still shifting gears at Pocono. And he... Tore his transmission up in about five laps to start of a race. One of the right. strangest things I've ever seen is watching that race at Pocono. And I heard people on the radio saying, man, this guy's that unbelievable engine. And Robbie Gordon would come barreling off the turns and pass three cars and then get passed by three cars before he went in the next turn. And then his car broke after less than 20 laps. So, He's a victim so, of doing it his way. That's his that's problem. Exactly right. And God love him for that, but I don't think he's the ideal guy that you want to build a motorsports program around. And I think that for every person that says that, you're going to have people advising Dodge like, do you really want to take this kind of risk? So yeah. I may be wrong. And maybe if, if that happens, I think it would show even more the fact that there's a certain level of desperation. But we're just going to have to see that the silence is deafening, and it's been that way for a long time. Yeah. Hey, Marty, hey, Marty uh, you get, we know you got to get on the radio. I know you're doing uh, uh, serious radio this morning. What time you go on? I'm on 11 a.m. That would be 10 a.m. your time. Okay. Right. So we had. I, I, hey, how how injured? Uh, how serious is the back injury of Denny Hamlin? Well, I, you know, we don't get the trainer's report. We just know what he is. I think he's in a fair amount of pain. But if there's anything from the history of Denny Hamlin, probably, that, that probably suggests he'll win the next five races because when he tore his knee up, he really had he, he did great. So, uh, I mean, I think he's. I think he is in some pain, and it's acting up, but my, I, you know, I don't think he's going to all of a sudden have back surgery in the middle of the season. I think he's just got a lot of problems with back spasms and a 
and it's probably something maybe will be repaired in the off season, but I think they'll muddle through it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ask you for a prediction of who wins tonight's race because I think that's a crapshoot at best on these restrictor plate tracks. But give me kind of a prediction of what kind of a race we'll see and just how this might play out for whoever wins it. Probably well, I, think, I think. I think this sport. Is, I think this race is going to have. I think one of the compelling issues is going to be the fact that Dale Hart Jr. is a fine restrictor plate driver who hasn't won one, at least not in a points race, in a long, long time. His last victory at both Talladega and Daytona was in 2004. He hasn't won at Daytona uh, since the 500 in 2004. And I think that he's – a lot of eyes will be on him like always, but it's, in some ways it's reached the point where he does have the, the best average finish, 14.4, I think, uh, of any active driver at Daytona. And he did finish second at the Daytona 500. And that alone makes him somebody who's a compelling person to watch. But – uh, it's been a long time for this restricted plate master, and you keep hearing him, it's really more based on long ago reputation than what he's done lately. So that's one of the things to watch, I think. And I think Kenseth is uh, going to be a factor. Uh, I think Tony Stewart will be a factor. And I think the fact that he's been dropped to the back is going to make it a lot of fun to watch him, but he's going to have to dodge. Uh, I believe that most of these guys have changed their beliefs. I don't think that uh, – I think if you're going to drop back, you got to drop way back. I think that if you – uh, put yourself in the middle of the field, you're really playing with fate here because I think there's going to be some accidents and some big contenders are going to be eliminated when they got sit back in traffic. I love what happened to Dennis Patrick last night. Right. Yeah. Monty, thanks so much for being on the show. We appreciate it. Have a good call today on Sirius Satellite Radio. You go on at 10 o'clock uh, Central Time. And again, thanks for taking the time always for us. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, and I'm, I hope hope there'll be something to, something to write about tonight. But it's, very, very unusual if it's not that way here at Daytona. That's true. Thanks, Monty. Thanks, oh, I appreciate you having me. Monty Dutton, the Gaston Gazette. I tell you the reason why we love having this guy on, he's honest, and he's just an interesting guy. Monty Dutton. Yeah. I'll yeah. tell you, 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 he he does not. He's been around this sport for so many years now that he really doesn't care a lot about what he, you know, what people think about him. He just he says what he words. feels, and That's I like sure. that. Yeah, he doesn't mince words. And we are going to uh, – no, I tell you, he's talking about Brad Keselowski a little bit earlier, who uh, I, I'm i going to play a soundbite from him, uh, what he talked about uh, in the media center after his win at Kentucky on Saturday night. kind of goes along with what Monty talked about, that uh, he gets it, and we'll play that, and we'll take your phone calls too as we head towards the top of the hour, 913-3810-810. Join us. Uh, talk about what we've been talking about NASCAR or anything else on your mind involving motorsports. You're with the Racing Boys here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Track Talk. 